Okay, so um, this week, which is not week four in, uh, in terms of how long it's been since we did this last time, uh, but what would have been week four, which is still our current week, um, we're looking at meaning and language in our study of covenant, uh, covenant theology in a dispensational culture. Um, just as a bit of a quick recap, our first three classes that we worked through, we, we first took a look at just what dispensational theology is as a whole. We, we tried to answer that. We talked about how there's so many different variations of dispensational theology that sometimes it's hard to really nail down what it is um, because it's changed. It's kind of uh, been modified throughout the years. And uh, sometimes that does happen with theological systems. Um, but what we did was we said we're going to look at Dallas Theological Seminary because they are probably the most prominent and most academic representation of, of dispensational theology. And so because of that, we're going to just kind of work through some of the doctrines that they propose as kind of a way for us to navigate through dispensational theology. And after that, we spent a week talking about covenant theology and particularly um, how a covenant framework is probably the best kind of framework to have when you're working your way through the Bible. And then a uh, week prior to this, we talked about the universal church and that is not universalism, but that is uh, the church as all of God's people in all times. So that week was really trying to get at the big issue of is it correct or is it incorrect to say that there is a distinction or there's two different people groups between the church and ethnic Israel. That's kind of where we left off. And so this week, while it might sound a little tedious, uh, we're going to cover meaning and language. And the reason for that is because crucial to our understanding of the Bible, regardless of what we're talking about, whether it's dispensational theology, whether it's um, something else, it really matters that we understand that the Bible communicates meaning and language to us. And uh, there we go. There's uh, Mark Ely and Mark and Karen Miller. Okay. Uh, but it's really important that we understand this at, at the very outset. Um, so if you have a Bible, uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, some of these uh, passages we're going to be covering will be on the screen. Uh, but I still wanted you to be able to see it right, right in front of your eyes as we, as we work our way through. All right, so the first issue we want to look at is objectivity and, and subjectivity. Those are two big issues as it comes to um, reading the Bible. So our first passage we're going to look at is Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 13, and here's what it says. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joint to the marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. This passage has really gotten into a interesting approach in politics, and we won't get into a whole lot of that, but I do want to make a point uh, that when it comes to our country, you hear an argument being made uh, every now and then about the Constitution, and the argument that's made is that our Constitution is a living document, and most of the time when somebody says that, what they mean is it should be something that is on the potter's wheel, something that can be shaped and molded to fit the needs of the society at that time. Now, what's unfortunate is that in liberal theology, when we read this passage, uh, somebody 
who is a proponent of literal the of liberal theology would say see the bible says right here that it's living and active and that's why the bible can be shaped and molded to fit the needs of the culture at any given time and that's an argument that is fairly common unfortunately um, but I want to point out that when we're thinking about objectivity and subjectivity, it's unfortunate that people will look at this verse oftentimes and misunderstand the fact that God's word is living and active and say, see, the Bible's subjective. The Bible can be changed and molded into whatever is appropriate for the time. And when really the author of Hebrews is making the exact opposite conclusion here. What he's saying when God's word is living and active is that it's objective, not subjective, not able to be changed and molded to fit our own needs, but it's objective truth, sharper than any two-edged sword. When this phrase living and active is used, it's a phrase to represent absolute authority. It's the same concept of when God speaks in Genesis 1 and creates the heavens and earth, and through the sheer power of his word, life happens. The heavens and earth are created and formed, and that same objective authority is present in the written scriptures, which we have the word of God being living and active. And that's really important for us to understand, and it's also important to note that at least at this point, we as those who agree with covenant theology and dispensationalists would agree with what I've just said. We both want to make a big deal about the fact that the scripture is infallible, that the scripture is without error, that the scripture doesn't answer to us as if we are a higher authority, but the scriptures have the absolute authority of, of God himself. And that is a good thing that we're in agreement, but unfortunately, we almost go opposite directions as soon as we finish saying that. And we can see that in this next heading, which is a big question, right? Does the Bible have meaning or does the Bible have meanings, plural? This next uh, little passage I wanna share with you uh, comes from our Confession of Faith. And it says this, um, the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which is not manifold but one, it must be searched and known but, uh, by, that should say by, by other places that speak more clearly. Um, most of you, I'm sure, have heard the phrase, um, we should be interpreting scripture by scripture. Well, that's exactly what the um, writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith are saying here. They're saying, we might get to parts in the Bible, and trust me, we will in this class, uh, that may seem somewhat confusing, that might seem not as clear as other passages of scripture, such as John 3.16. But what we do when we get to these more obscure, for lack of a better term, passages is that we take those passages, we work under the truth that we just talked about, that all of the Bible is God's full objective truth and authority. Therefore, it's not going to have errors. It's not going to contradict itself. And if that's true, then we can look at the passages that might be somewhat confusing, and we can find their right meaning, find the right interpretation by other scriptures that speak more clearly or more plainly. So that is, again, uh, right at the heart of the issue, because when, when we get to, let me go ahead and actually go down to my last slide just to show you a little timeline here. Um, when we get to these kind of last half, especially dealing with the Great Tribulation, the Millennium, the Rapture, those are our controversial topics. But what we must make sure that we're doing is we're operating off of the principle that when we get to a confusing verse, we look at the verses that speak clearly. And since they speak clearly, since they don't contradict themselves, we can know if this is true and it's not confusing, 
that must remain true even in a passage that is somewhat more confusing or not as clear. And what you'll see is in dispensational theology and covenant theology, we both try to do that, but we do it from opposite ends and we come to opposite results. So I just want to point that out to you. Now, this is the tedious part, and I want you to follow me here because um, it's so important that we grasp this. Um, just a quick check here. Everybody still see the slides on the screen? Everything clear enough and all? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. And by the way, if you have any questions, um, just speak up. If you raise your hand, I won't see you. I'll see about three of you right now on the screen. Um, <laughs> So if you have a question, just start talking and you, you should start overriding me <laughs> and I'll quit and listen to you. Uh, so still want, still want to have that option. Um, this next section we're going to look at is so important. The uh, issue of the Bible in terms of its grammar and in terms of talking about redemption. And for this, uh, what I want to do is direct your attention uh, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. This isn't going to be on the slides. So, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we're going to look at um, a really interesting element of, of Bible interpretation. And whenever we get there, we'll be reading um, from, from verse 1. Let's see here. Let me move back to you. Okay, if somebody that has a microphone, this will be fun, somebody that has a microphone uh, would like to read for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 11. Moreover. All right, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant uh, how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all did eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drank, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Thank you. There's a whole lot here, but for the purposes of our class, I want to point out a really, really important fact, and this actually ties into our last time together. Um, Notice at the very beginning, verse 1, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, what's so important here is that in our last conversation about um, the difference in covenant theology and dispensationalism being probably the most primary one, that the church and Israel are two different people that don't interconnect in dispensationalism, whereas covenant theology doesn't want to make that distinction or separation 
is probably a better word. Notice here, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, almost assuredly a primarily Gentile congregation, not ethnic Jews. And notice that Paul includes them into the historical framework of ethnic Israel. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud. And then he moves on. Again, he calls ethnic Israel our fathers. He's speaking to Gentiles. He's making a huge connection here, a redemptive connection here between what happens in the Old Testament and how it relates to us, what the application is for us in the New Testament. And the way that we know he's doing that is when we move on further in this passage, he says this. This is extraordinary to me in verse 4. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. That is incredible to hear Paul say that, because, again, in dispensationalism, there's a tendency to really separate what God is doing in the Old Testament from the New Testament. You certainly wouldn't hear many people make the claim that there is this explicit engagement with Jesus Christ himself in the Old Testament. You may hear things such as people talking about theophanies or Christophanies, which are just fancy words for talking about an instance of God appearing or an instance of Christ appearing in the Old Testament. But here, he's making this spiritual connection between what our reality is and what their reality was in the Old Testament. And he says very plainly in verse number 6 and in verse number 11 what we're to do with this. Verse number 6, these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And we move on to verse 11. These things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. So Paul has no shame in bringing us in, in the New Testament, Gentiles, into the redemptive historical framework of the Old Testament. Paul is not simply just making the case that what you have here in the Old Testament is historically accurate. I think it's very clear that Paul is making that case, but Paul doesn't just stop at the history, nor does he stop at the grammar, such as talking about this passage as an Old Testament narrative, or this passage just having some kind of ethical inspiration for us, but instead there's a real spiritual connection here in the Old Testament and our day in life in the New Testament. And I think what you have here is just very loosely anyways, you have Paul arguing for a, there's the phrase again, let me actually pull it up so you can, so you can see it. I had it up, I, I forgot I took it down. You have Paul arguing for a redemptive historical reading of scripture, not a grammatical historical reading of scripture. Now, I think it's also important uh, for us to realize when we ask the question, okay, what's the difference? Well, the difference is this. In a grammatical historical interpretation, we even as, as Reformed Christians, as covenant theologians, we would agree with grammatical historical. This is an attempt to read the Bible as historically accurate and also to care what the text says, to exposit the text. And that obviously means looking at the grammar, looking at the genre, those kind of things. But we don't stop there. We're not just linguistics and historians. We're also Christians. We're also trying to understand the, the spiritual connection and the um, proper interpretation, the significance for us as being led by the Holy Spirit. And that is why I think a better method is redemptive historical. And that's what you see, especially in covenant theology. Now, what does it mean that we say redemptive historical? Well, I think we can look right here, Luke 24. 
What does it mean to read the Bible redemptive historically? Jesus said this. This was after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus. He comes alongside the disciples. They're upset, and he wants to encourage them. One of the ways he does that is by having probably the best uh, uh, impromptu Bible study that has ever taken place. And here's what Jesus says to them. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That leads us into answering this question. How we answer this question really is going to dictate whether we will agree with covenant theology or not. What is the thread of history, and is there a thread of history? Are there separate dispensations that aren't mixed or mingled together, such as dispensational theology says God has one plan for ethnic Israel and another plan for the church, and there's not a whole lot of commonality, there's some relationship, but not much? Or is there a single thread of history working itself all the way from Genesis to Revelation? Well, I think we would agree, I hope, that the answer is the second, not the first, that there is one thread of history working all the way through Genesis to Revelation. I know it's been a while since we did this class together, but we looked at Genesis 3, where God makes the promise that one is going to come to crush the head of the serpent. And from that point on, that promise is being fulfilled. It's being shown in all of the covenants, right? It's being shown in the life of Moses, in the life of Abraham, the life of David. All the way through, you see Jeremiah talk about this new covenant, but all of these covenants are speaking to that one great and grand fulfillment this thread of history that's working all the way to the book of Revelation. And that is God's plan of redemption. That's why we read the Bible. That's why we use the phrase redemptive historical. And that's because the idea of redemption, God's plan, supersedes just looking at the Bible in a grammatical way. And it even supersedes looking at the Bible in a historical way. And I'll show you what that means. Here we look at Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. This is a really fascinating verse because depending on your Bible translation, it's going to read differently. Uh, but it says this. Also, and I know this is right in the middle of the context of the book, so just forgive me that we're not going to get into it, but it says this. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. Now, depending on your translation, this last phrase will not say what I just read from the ESV. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain, but it will say this instead. Everyone whose name has not been written in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. Now, again, uh, so Josh could speak to this a lot better than I could because in, in Greek, you don't always have the order of events in a sentence the same way that you do in English. You actually have modifiers on the ends of like nouns and verbs to show which nouns connected to which verb and so on and so forth. That's about as far as I can explain before talking nonsense. Um, but I think it comes down to an issue in translation of which one is right. Is it that those who were not written before the foundation of the world or the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world? And the reason that even matters, the reason we're even talking about something so obscure as this, is because the lamb being slain is God's redemptive plan. It is all the way through the Bible. It is God's purpose. It is God's goal. And it is the focal point of history. 
it is the focal point of what God is accomplishing. It's the focal point of really what we're celebrating today. You could say that Jesus' death doesn't have any significance if he didn't raise from the dead, but you could also say that Jesus' resurrection from the dead only is an intelligible statement if we understand that he was crucified, that he died. And so this concept and the concept of our names being written in the book of life before the foundation of the world is not just an issue of thinking about predestination or thinking about election. It's an issue of understanding that this is God's plan, not plan B, not plan C, not amendment 3-6. This is God's plan. This is God's work. And we're included in that as our name being written in the book of life. Now, the reason that matters, the reason why we're looking at this passage is because this is what it means to read the Bible redemptive historically. We don't suddenly stumble into Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. The whole Bible is full of the reality of Christ. We even saw it in 1 Corinthians 10. Even what was happening in the wilderness was centered upon Jesus, the spiritual rock. Even when we consider different passages in the Old Testament, such as David, such as Abraham, all of these promises are fulfilled in Jesus. Every angle that we try to come at the Bible is Christ-centered, and thus, since it is, that means that redemption is that focal point of the historical development of the Bible. I just, again, want to really emphasize that because in dispensationalism, they won't say that redemption doesn't matter. They won't say that Jesus doesn't even come on the scene until Matthew 1, but they will say that this plan that we're talking about is unique to the church. And God has a different plan, or at least a different way of getting ethnic Israel to the plan than he does for us. And then, in my opinion, you start getting into God has all these different purposes, all these different plans, all these different, all these different uh, hopes and dreams for us, but they're all going to be happening in different ways, different varieties. So you just start getting into this disunity of the Bible. And I think that's one of the biggest issues with dispensational theology is even if they're not trying to, even if they're trying to see the Bible as historically accurate and have a, you know, the Bible is infallible and inerrant, even the, when those things are good, I think in the name of trying to protect that, they start taking the Bible and dissecting it and having a whole lot of different variations because they think there's no possible way we can shoehorn everything that's happening into the Bible into one big promise. So does anybody have any questions at this point? I know that was a mouthful there, but uh, I just want to pause real quick before we move on any further, make sure anybody has any questions or comments. Okay. The reality of redemption is seen in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20. This is a pretty simple passage and sometimes it's so simple that we miss the significance of it. But I'm just basically proving what I just said. For all the promises of God find their yes in him, that is Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All the promises is a pretty broad statement, but it's especially helpful when we think about what point Paul is making here. So the point he's making is having the Old Testament in mind, also having our future in mind. And that same reality that we talked about last time, thinking about the universal church, still remains true when we're thinking about methods of interpretation. All the promises of God find their yes in him. We could say it this way, all the covenants of God find their yes in him. All the fulfillments of God find their yes in him. All the purposes of God find their yes in him. All of these things, promises, something that God vows to do, something that God will do because he doesn't lie, all of these things work together 
and come to a fulfillment in Jesus. That's why we can take all of these broad storylines, Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, et cetera, et cetera, Noah. That's why we can take all of these and see their fulfillment and see their spiritual reality as being in Jesus. And that's why we can read them the way Paul tells us to in 1 Corinthians 10, even though we're Gentiles living in a different time and place as ethnic Israel. That's why we can still read those and have a relationship, have an application to them, is because we are found in Christ. And if we're found in Christ, all the promises are found in him. Therefore, we partake in all the promises as well. Even if dispensationalists would agree with that, the next argument is, okay, when do we participate in all those promises? And of course, that's the argument when we get into the millennium and the uh, rapture and the great tribulation, all those things. Here's our, our last little, oh yeah, go ahead. Somebody talking. Yes, this is Jeff. And I don't know if I'm saying this right, but the verse in Revelation that we just went through, would that apply to the covenant of redemption that was before the world was created between uh, the Godhead, between the Trinity? I, I would say so. Yeah, so great question there. That... Um, Great question, because it actually helps me to, to say this, too. Um, if you're unaware of what he just talked about, um, this was week two in our study. And if you go to sermon audio, you can listen to the audio recordings of that. Uh, so that um, covenant of redemption or covenant of uh, between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as it's commonly referred to, is somewhat debated as to whether it's an actual covenant, but it's at least um, agreed that it is a um, commitment and a commonality between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that this plan of redemption didn't just happen one day after sin entered into the world, but it was an eternal purpose of God. And we looked at that as the case in Ephesians 2 and 3, and we also looked at it especially in John chapter 17, in Jesus' high priestly prayer. And the point that's made is that God's plan of redemption is and was always his plan. He didn't create the world and suddenly everything went wrong and he had to scramble and change all of his intentions because of that. But instead, God, even with sin entering into the world, so on and so forth, God's one plan is still being carried out, not being modified, but being carried out to its fullest. And that was a plan made, as it were, uh, for lack of a better term, in, e in eternity past. And what he's talking about there in uh, his question is this, uh, names being written in the, in the book of life from the foundation of the world. <clears throat> Great question there. I think, I think the answer is yes. Um, Josh, do you have anything you want to add to that or correct me? <laughs> uh, no, I think I think you're right, and I think our uh, our confession would interpret it that way, um, regardless of what you were talking about with the modifiers in the Greek language. Just the uh, the idea of the covenant of grace being made with Christ and His seed, which would include um, us. Okay, so, I'm sorry. So, is it a Presbyterian covenant that we hold to the covenant of redemption, or is it just as you termed it differently? Is it not an actual covenant? Uh, there, I would say um, the answer is there are some with within. Um, Presbyterianism, that would agree with all the details of it, but they would maybe be a little hesitant to, to call it a covenant formally as much as they would 
um, just an agreement or a unified purpose between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, so I would say it's, it's kind of debatable as to <clears throat> call it a covenant or not. Um, but in ter- as far as Presbyterianism, um, this is something that either, even uh, Reformed Baptists would, would agree with um, as well. Yeah. You want to chime in on that one? Or no? We don't have the notes. From, from a PCA perspective, is that something we would say, this is the covenant of redemption, or would we not say that? I think, I, like I said, I think there's, I think there's both. Um, I feel comfortable saying that, um, but there are, that actual phrase, I don't think is a necessarily a hill to die on in, um, in the PCA. There'd probably be some that would say um, it is and some that, that it isn't, but regardless of, of what, if they would say it is or not, they would still say that the covenant of grace um, which they would all agree to. And if you're an ordained minister, you would have to adhere to the idea of the covenant of grace, which is in the confession. Um, they would say that the covenant of grace is the is the outworking of God's uh, plan of redemption, God's covenant of redemption. Um, <clears throat> so I know it's kind of a non-answer, but the answer is yes and no, depending on who you ask. Josh, you want to say? Yeah, uh, Jeff, it would be... Um... This is where our, our confession is a, a pretty broad document. Um, it, it seems very narrow when we read it, but there are a lot of different um, voices and interpretations. And so the, the term covenant of redemption may not be used, um, but that's not to say it, it's, uh, it, it is within the, the bounds of orthodoxy to hold to it. And most reformed theologians uh, would have, I don't have a, an issue with the term, um, it is, there's just different aspects of the, the covenant, you know, having to do with us, um, and then having to do with what was worked out, if we can use that language, between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So there are aspects there, and then aspects that are worked out in history. Um, whether or not we call that an overarching covenant of redemption is what Kevin is saying is not necessarily um, explicit. Uh, as far as the language goes, but uh, John Owen and so many other uh, huge theological minds uh, had no issue with it, so I don't either. Yeah, and uh, let me make a plug. Thank you for mentioning John Owen, my my favorite theologian of all time. Um, One of the best books you can read by John Owen is Communion with God, and it's especially relevant here because when John Owen writes Communion with God, he deals with all the particular workings of each person of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he does that with this uh, continued mentioning of the covenant of grace and covenant of redemption, like Josh is saying. So um, that book is just really good, and I think it's pretty relevant to the, to the question here as well. Thank you. Yes. All right. So... Um, Got just a couple of slides left here. Let me pull them up. We're on your icon with you in the white. Did you turn the video off? No. Okay. All right. Um, Here's a question for. Let me make sure I'm sure. Everybody see the slide? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm question is this. um, Dispensationalism, as I mentioned before, the the threefold characteristics of dispensationalism, one of them being the literal method of interpretation. This is a hill to die on for dispensationalists. Not, Not to mean that they would say you're not a Christian if you don't follow this, but they would say you're wrong (laughs) if you don't follow this. (laughs) So you don't want to be a wrong Christian. So um, the question is this, does literal always mean accurate? Um, Most of your well-known dispensationalists of of today, such as John MacArthur, who is even still a modified dispensationalist, I'd say he's a lot more on par 
than some of your other issues. Um, the school I go to, Moody Bible Institute, um, Dallas Theological Seminary, David Jeremiah, right? These are all dispensational teachers. And they make the case again and again and again, you must interpret the Bible literally. There are only, if any, a very few exceptions to this rule, but you must interpret it literally. Now, let's answer that at the very outset with this. Galatians 4, 24 to 26. This isn't the only verse I want to, I want to call your attention to, but it's one that really just is very uh, provocative. Now, this may be interpreted, doesn't say literally, it says allegorically. These two women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. Now, frankly, if this passage were not in the Bible, but it was somebody's revolutionary interpretation, it could be argued by somebody who's a staunch literalist that what you have just said is evidence that you're on some kind of drug. Because how did you come to that conclusion? Well, I think that's a wrong approach to uh, dismissing this kind of allegory. In dispensationalism, you hear that the allegorical method of interpretation kind of sprung up during Augustine's day. And it became a novelty method to approaching the Bible. And here we are. Now we have covenant theologians who are interpreting the Bible allegorically and symbolically. And again, that defense mechanism is happening in a dispensationalist. And why is that? Well, it's because a dispensationalist is anything but a liberal theologian. They are holding to their principle that the Bible is infallible. The Bible is without error. The Bible is objective truth. And in the name of holding to those truths, they are afraid that if we start interpreting the Bible allegorically, we're rendering all of those things useless. We're making the Bible subjective. How do you have objective standards in place for allegory? Allegory is symbolic. Allegory is representative. Well, I think it's not as hard of a question as, as they're asking, because if we just simply look back to our Chapter one of our confession, we have that guiding interpretation principle. Scripture is interpreted by scripture. Now, this really comes into two angles because you're dealing with the difference between an interpretation of scripture and an application of scripture. But either way, we can at least know that any proposed allegory is automatically wrong if it's contradicting something that scripture says somewhere else. That's a pretty easy uh, check and checks and balance method for Bible interpretation. And some would also argue here, <clears throat> if you're a staunch dispensationalist, that allegory is just the just a, not a good term to use as a translation. It shouldn't be translated allegory. But those who would agree that it is allegory will at least say this: Yes, this is allegory. But the only allegory that is allowed in the Bible is the allegory that the Bible explicitly states. In other words, the only allegory that's present in the Bible is right here in Galatians. And I think that's what I say. I just, mm -hmm. I just think yeah. <clears throat> I think that's an that's an unnecessary conclusion. And it's not it's not a license. I'm sorry. No, but you can. It is. It's an allegory. Okay, that's all I'm saying. That's what it says in the scripture. Yeah. So how are you? Gonna... So you're a dispensationalist, is that it? You're a literalist. I'm trying to see who's talking. I heard Sam. I, who else was was talking? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know my microphone was on. I was talking to Laura. Okay. Who else was talking? I wasn't having it show up here. <laughs> 
It was probably Laura. Okay. All right. Gotcha. So, sorry about that. No, no, it that's was, okay. That's that's all right. I th I thought it was a question to me. I I wanted to make sure I didn't miss it there. Um, no, I'm. I didn't. Am I broadcasting to everybody when I talk to her? Right now you are. Don't say anything you'll regret. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good. Well, that that's fine. That she was taking advantage of asking her husband, like the <laughs> scripture says. Okay. And didn't realize she was asking everybody. No, that's that's fine. Um, but but it's a good question there. Um, even though it wasn't to me, it was a good question nonetheless. Um, you got a uh, mute control there, Sam, uh, somewhere on your screen. My screen is so. You might, if you're on your phone, you may be able to just just tap your screen. You'll see the options come up. Okay, I'll try to I'll try to get us uh, through this here. Um, the point of bringing this whole passage up is, is this, um, at the very least, allegory is at least allowed in the Bible, according to this passage. That doesn't mean that we take every single passage and turn it into an allegory of something obscure that has no basis in scripture, because then we're contradicting scripture and we're obviously not right. But what is being communicated here is we can look at Old Testament historical truths and see the spiritual significance to them. I would at least point out here that I've probably um, set us up for failure because I've just chosen three verses and pulled them out of context like a con artist, but I would just advise you to go back to uh, Galatians 4, read the whole chapter or, you know, we're quarantined basically. So just read the whole, read the whole book. You can't go wrong, but you'll see what those spiritual truths are that Paul's making the connection to. Now let me turn your attention here to show you one more. That's very interesting. Revelation 11, seven through eight. When they had finished, this is about the two witnesses in Revelation 11. When they had finished their testimony, the beast that rises from the bottomless pit will make war on them and conquer them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city that symbolically is called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Now, the reason I bring this passage up <clears throat> is as a segue to our later discussions. What I'm not trying to do right now is tell you that every passage can be interpreted in some other way than literal. But what I am trying to do is show you that we cannot maintain the literal only approach to the whole Bible. And that is going to be a tipping point when we start getting into the book of Revelation and others that are dealing with so-called end times issues. Because you ask the question here, <clears throat> the great city that is symbolically called Sodom in Egypt, where their Lord was crucified. Well, where was Jesus crucified? Was he crucified in Jerusalem? Was he crucified in Sodom? Or was he crucified in Egypt? And is Sodom and Egypt and Jerusalem the same place? And on top of that, what does symbolically mean? Again, this passage is just an example of why, though it's not wrong to have in mind that the Bible should be taken literally, it is wrong to say that every single passage has to be literal. Now, don't mistake the word literal for true, and don't mistake the word literal for representing something that's true, because what dispensationalism does with all the language of the Bible, or at least tries to, is that <clears throat> if a passage is something other than literal, then we're somehow making the argument that it's not true or it's not historically accurate. And again, that's the defense mechanism happening because dispensationalism kind of raised up as a Bible interpretation method to combat liberal theology. And it should have combated liberal theology because liberal theology was saying you could have passages that are symbolic or metaphorical. What they weren't saying is those passages were still true. For example, Jesus' resurrection from the dead. 
the virgin birth of Christ, the Bible being without error. All of these liberal theologians were saying these things don't really matter. What matters is the kind of application we can get off of these life lessons. You can get a life lesson from the story that Jesus rose from the dead without having to argue that he actually rose from the dead. Well, dispensationalism rightly rises up and says, you can't take this symbolic approach and render the Bible to be anything other than true and infallible. But again, over the years, that argument, which was a good argument to make, that argument has turned into anything that's not literal is automatically saying the Bible's not true or the Bible's not accurate or the Bible's not historical. What we're saying is it doesn't have to be literalistic in every single verse, and it can still be true. It can still be historically accurate, and that's because the Bible uses meaning and language. God doesn't just communicate to us in a historical narrative. God doesn't just communicate to us in apocalyptic language. God doesn't just communicate to us in poetry, in wisdom literature. God doesn't just communicate to us in instructional letters, like we have in the New Testament, or gospel accounts. God uses all of these unique language tools to communicate to us. That doesn't mean the Bible's not true. That doesn't mean it's not historically accurate. But it does mean that we have to have a big view of genre. We have to have a big view of language. We have to understand, is this symbolic, such as this passage here, very explicitly symbolic, or is it literal? And what we're saying is we respect the genre, we respect the type of literature it is, and we work off of that principle with the caveat that the Bible is not going to contradict itself because it is true. And so that is the approach that we're going to make with this whole class today being kind of a foundational class to the weeks ahead. We're going to use that principle to tackle these next classes. The end, the rapture, this age and the age to come, the great tribulation, the millennium. We're going to be working off of this principle so that we can understand these passages without having to say, well, they're symbolic, so therefore they're not true, or everything in it has to be absolutely literal. So that is our method. That's our approach. That's what we're going to do in the weeks ahead, and that's how we're going to, Lord willing, come to a good understanding. We might not understand every element, but we're going to be able to understand the, the big ideas of each of these topics. So in uh, conclusion, this class, I've mentioned things to come and Christ of the Covenants um, basically every week. I want to add a third one here. Amillennialism by Kim Riddlebarger. And let me uh, see here. So I have it with me. I know Sam has a copy. Let me see if I can get that on the screen. Good enough. You can find it on Amazon and other places. And uh, I really recommend that book because, among other things, this book is, um, has a heart for dispensationalists. What we don't want to do is say they're wrong and we're right, and aren't we so much more spiritually superior to them? Instead, we should have hearts of compassion, which I said back in week one, that what we're trying to do is be well-informed so we can have good dialogue. We have good conversation. We don't want to throw Bible verse darts at each other, but we want to have good edifying conversation and make a big deal about the truth of the Bible. This book is great because uh, Kim, who's a pastor and a professor out at West, uh, Westminster Seminary, California, he also grew up as a dispensationalist. So now he's a, a covenant theologian, uh, but he understands the workings of dispensationalism, and he has a great section in this book that talks about why we can't interpret the whole Bible in a rigid literalistic framework. And he does that with also arguing that the Bible is absolutely true and historically accurate. Um, so I really want to recommend that book. It's especially going to be helpful to our weeks to come as well, but it'll really speak to what we're talking about today in probably a much better way uh, than I can. Uh, so I know we're a couple minutes over time, uh, but does anybody have any questions or comments you'd like to make before we uh, close?
uh, Kevin, your your point about uh, liberalism finding meaning um, and dispensationalism, the, the literal approach, that's that's an excellent point. Um, it, it gives us um, the reminder that our uh, dispensational brothers and sisters, most of them are, are closer to us than the old dispensationalism in their way of interpreting scripture, um, such as John MacArthur. So we can have a great appreciation for their uh, stand on the word of God as authoritative and true. Yeah. Um, and but then also at the same time, um, it's a good reminder for us to take scripture on its own terms and the, the various genres of literature, uh, prophetic and uh, symbolic, where like you the verse you read from Revelation, uh, that that apocalyptic genre is um, understood as something symbolic, but it uh, also doesn't give us the license to read the Old Testament like uh, like it's Pilgrim's Progress, you know, like um, yeah. finding the in the red cord from uh, Rahab, you know, there's uh, it's red, so it must represent the blood of Christ or something. Um, sometimes the uh, the way it's pointing us to Christ and that redemptive historical kind of seeing the the forest, the overall forest, even though we're looking at trees, is just history moving along towards the coming of Christ. Other times it's very typological. We might have someone that. Um, a prophet, a priest, or a king who, who is a type of Christ. Um, anyway, I just really enjoyed it. Really appreciative for the balance. Uh, and I wanted to remind you about your, your songs and just to remind us that you recorded. Are you going to, were you going to point us to those? Thanks. So let me, um, let me see if I can type a link here. So, yeah, so we put the songs on our YouTube channel. And if you all can access the chat, <clears throat> let's see. Send to everyone. There we go. Um, I just sent a link there. I don't know if it doesn't look like it's clickable though. If you guys can pull up the chat, see if you can see that on there. You may you may have to manually copy it and put in your web browser. Um, but if you go on YouTube also, you can type in Ortega Presbyterian Church in the search, and you'll see two accounts. You'll see the older one that we've been doing live stream uh, sermons on, um, but then you'll see the new one that we've just made, and that one has four videos, and they're just me. <laughs> that, that's Those are the four videos that are on there. So you should be, a, you could also just type in Ortega Presbyterian Church, Kevin Morris, probably, and it'll probably pull it right up in the search bar for YouTube. Um, what I'll do is also, uh, probably the best way to do it would be send it out via um, a PDF file. Maybe we can just add it on our next church email, but I can just send the, the outline of this class and notes um, for people if they want to look at it later. And this says it's recording right now, so I might be able to take the audio and put it on Sermon Audio, um, but we'll see. I'll have to play around with it afterwards. Hey, Kevin. Hey. Where, do, where on Sermon Audio do we find this? Um, just on the search, uh, the very top of, uh, of the Sermon Audio homepage, you can type in Ortega Presbyterian Church, <clears throat> and the drop-down menu will probably come right up, and you'll see it on there. Okay. And that right now, that has all of our previous sessions for this class. <clears throat> and there's also PDF downloads that I've attached on there for the outlines and all. So you'll see all of that. Anybody else? Okay. Um, Josh, would you like to close us out in prayer or say any closing comments while you, while you do that before I end this? <clears throat> yeah, sure thing. Um, Kevin mentioned the new YouTube channel. We're trying to get everything moved to one place. Uh, the new sermon that went out this morning is still on Vimeo. That's because it was too long for YouTube. Um, it's not extremely long, I promise. It's like 40 minutes. Uh, but uh, uh, we'll fix that and uh, and try. It's just an easier, uh, it's more user-friendly, of course, and people are more familiar with it. So 
um, we'll get that switched over soon enough. But it's in your inbox this morning, so uh, there is a, a link to the sermon. And we'll meet again tonight at 5.30 for prayer. Um, the same uh, password, the same meeting room number um, should be the same for all the, all the Ortega hosted stuff. Uh, all right, I'll pray. All right. Father, thank you for this time together. Uh, thank you for gifting your church with, with uh, teachers uh, such as Kevin and Carl and Mark and David and those who have stood before us. Uh, we thank you for those who have labored to teach the children as well and, and how you have used this uh, Christian education ministry at Ortega to uh, have us grow in the grace and knowledge of you, our Lord. And we thank you most of all for Jesus Christ. We remember him, the one who was crucified and risen from the dead. And we pray that the uh, that we would not only have the assurance of hope today in his resurrection, um, but that we would be affected in our hearts, that we would um, uh, not just be uh, uh, assured to, to go on about our, our lives and our own uh, uh, loves and um, enjoyments with the uh, the comforts and, and normalcy of, of what we experience, but we would we would appreciate and love these things for the sake of you and our, our God, the giver of all good gifts, and that our hope in Christ would be um, moving us uh, in our thoughts and our affections more and more towards you. And so uh, be with us, give us confidence in your word that it is indeed true that Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. We ask it in his name. Amen. Amen.